$15,000 a year. My elbows were sore for two months straight, $200 a month for this space. My name is Eric Bruski. Our business is Lumberjills Premium Firewood. And we got started about two years ago. Um, I've got three young daughters that I wanted to start a little gritty family business to teach them about hard work. And had a few chainsaws in a truck. I had some property with trees on it that I had access to, and that's how we started. And did you have to make any investments to get started with that? I had kind of a homeowner level chainsaw, so I had to buy a, a better one. I had a pickup truck already, but bought a uh, small utility trailer to get going to, to move logs back and forth. You know, an axe and a, an axe for the first couple months, which quickly required a, a log splitter after that, <laughs> but uh, pretty minimal to get going. Can you talk about the log splitter and how you found that and yeah the first one we bought was a, a canadian made uh, wallenstein so standard splitter but a little bit more heavy duty than just the traditional one but bought it used off of marketplace and in that uh really got us going and kept me from swinging an axe every day I, I my elbows were sore for two months straight so i i knew that wasn't sustainable how many bundles of wood can you get with like a log splitter in an hour how does that work yeah the splitter so the from chopping with an axe, I was probably able to go from a round piece into split firewood, probably about an hour and a half to do a face cord, which is roughly a, a truckload full, maybe two hours, you know, as you get tired out. The log splitter shrunk that time from an hour and a half to two hours down to about one hour. And then recently the splitter that we bought now is takes that one hour down to about 15 minutes so we've invested in in that part of the pot process being more efficient can you talk about your day-to-day -day process with this business so we get we get logs from various places some are people who want trees cut down and we do a little bit of that work some of it is storm damage cleanup some of it is uh developments that are turning a woods into a subdivision and we uh we either buy or, or take logs away that, that they just need cleared. So logs come in that I go pick up into the back part of our lot here. And then day to day, it's just moving those logs through our process. So from whole logs to rounds, we call them. So 16 inch pieces that haven't been split yet. Rounds get split into individual sticks or, or chunks of firewood. And then those are sold sort of by the face cord or truckload or bundled, so we do also bundle a bunch of wood for a campground that's local here. So that needs, uh, you know, batch it up into about three quarters of a cubic foot of volume, lash it together with some twine, put a handle on it, and then it's sold that way to, to campers. And who's it like your primary customers? Is it mainly campers? Is it homeowners? Is it restaurants? Yeah, right now, probably 75% of our revenue comes from that campground account. So that's a 200 site campground. It's open April to the end of October. So we bundle about 5,000 bundles on their season. So that's uh, about an hour and a half of work every day for those seven months to keep up. 20% of our revenue is, is homeowners, folks that are local that we bring wood to each fall, typically, you know, that they'll burn outside or inside over the next year. And then a small percentage that, that I'm looking to grow more is is restaurant folks. So a lot of the wood we have is cherry. We also have hickory. We also get apple, really nice species to smoke or cook uh, meat over or other smoked items. So I'd say that last 5% right now is restaurant business. I would love that to be 25% because restaurants have a demand, a steady demand year round which is really favorable for kind of a, a one-man operation. Are you doing any advertising online? Are people just driving by and seeing your wood outside? How do you get your customers? Sure, so we've got a roadside stand. So we do have some of the, I guess, more traditional, just drive by and see the product for sale. We do market ourselves on Facebook Marketplace. That is so powerful that I have to take that off a lot of times because I'm just, when it's on, it's more like this time of year, it's more demand than I can come up with in terms of delivering wood as a side business. So that's super strong, but I just kind of toggle it 
as I need to move product. And then a lot of word of mouth and, and repeat customers as you, as you get to know folks and do a good job. We've got a lot of subdivisions. We brought wood to one person, two months later, you know, three of their neighbors want some. And then like this year, year two has been cool. I've got some folks in subdivisions that kind of corral the neighbors and say, hey, bring us your big dump truck, your dump trailer full. I've got four customers, four neighbors that want firewood and it's, it's easy You bring one big supply and you're just doing three houses in a row. So those are kind of cool to see. Can you talk about some of the expenses that come along with this firewood business? So you've got uh, a fair bit of, of maintenance expense. You've got chainsaws that you're always sharpening chains on. They do break from time to time. So saws, fuel and oil and your saws and maintenance, chain sharpening, tires on trailers do you know go flat sometimes maintenance on a log splitter but most of the most of the maintenance cost is pretty low and your biggest expenses are our fuel you know fuel in the splitter fuel in a pickup truck do you know how much that might be per month probably a couple hundred dollars a month in in expense cost again most of that 80 percent of that being gas depending on how many deliveries we're doing what does the future look like what is growing or expanding how do you plan on doing that so we are we're definitely in a growth mode the goal for this business is sort of we started with a an end goal in mind which was I've got three daughters I wanted to have X amount of dollars saved for them by the time they go to college so I've worked that backwards into kind of a monthly profit target uh, to achieve that savings goal so we kind of are a bit unique in that we want to profit about fifteen thousand dollars a year to meet that target and with a little a little ability to go beyond that and kind of get there earlier but uh yeah that's sort of uh you know i don't want this to replace my day job i, I sit behind a computer eight hours a day and just wait for quitting time so i can go split wood so it's a good balance to uh kind of a stationary desk job you think one day they'll take over this business i hope so you know they go on deliveries they come with me to split wood um, it's usually an hour or two at a time you know they're nine six and six so they're i don't want them running chainsaws yet but <laughs> would like to someday or you know at least uh have an appreciation for hard work and uh, and see what it takes to kind of build something. So is this your property then? No, I rent the barn space and the couple acres around it from a local farmer here. Very marginal, so I pay $200 a month for this space, but I'm also his, his saw man, so farmers don't like dealing with trees. So if he has a new piece of property he buys and he wants the trees cleared or a tree somewhere falls down on his cornfield, you know, I'm typically the one going to take care of it for him so more of a barter thing but I, I do pay a little bit for the space too what was like the drive to actually start with like the firewood business I sort of knew that I wanted it to be a little bit gritty something that you know maybe you're used to seeing a guy like me as a firewood delivery guy and not cute little blonde headed girls and then for them you know the kind of philosophy part of uh, hey you can you can do hard stuff too you can do stuff that is typically stuff that men performed it doesn't have to be that way and then the name the lumber jills name is a cool you know concept so it everybody knows about rosie the riveter from the kind of world war ii sort of time so there were the equivalent lumber jills these teenagers in early 20s women that when the men went away to fight the war they occupied these lumber camps and learned how to cut down trees and work these really tough conditions you know continue to make wood products that were needed for the war efforts so and they called themselves lumber jills that was kind of their like that's what we are so uh yeah the timber core was another name but i was like that's kind of a perfect what we're trying to instill into them who was like your first customer how did you like very start out like how did you get your first tree how did you sell your first wood yeah i remember it i remember it very clear a guy named chad you know we had just i had some ash it was nice and dry i cut it up i had was doing it out of my driveway and uh, just put put a marketplace ad on and Chad replied and you know big bearded guy like super cool guy like he came to my house and was really excited about the wood that I had produced and was like man have you ever read there's a book that he referenced for me and he's like you got a Norwegian wood it's called he's like have you ever read that book and 
So he like, my first customer gave me a big stoke. I'm like, man, there's somebody that's like way excited about some firewood, you know? But then he was like, you gotta read that book. It's, it's almost poetic about Scandinavian countries and how they process firewood and how they stack it and history and you know, the BTU content of all the different types of wood and how they burn. And I'm kind of a science nerd by, by education and wiring anyway. So I just stuck to that. And I was like, this is, this is fun stuff. I like this. So Chad really kind of paved the way for us so he's yeah he's he's bought wood from us four or five times at this point and comes by once in a while checks us out and how much is one bundle of wood a bundle of wood we sell at our stand for five dollars we wholesale it to the campground for four and then if that bundle retail um, at the campground I think they sell it for eight but a lot of gas stations that sell wood you know sort of marginal quality but that bundle is usually six dollars to ten dollars at a at a retail space. And then when you deliver, are you charging an extra fee for that? Is that part of your service? How does that work? Yeah, we charge an extra fee for delivery. I really keep my delivery radi radius really small. I want only want to go maybe 10 miles from here. So mostly Celine, Ann Arbor, Dexter. Yeah, so we sell a face cord of firewood for 120. We charge 160 if they want that delivered. So typically, you know, it's covers gas, covers a little bit of time, but I think if we didn't deliver, we'd probably have a lot less business. And then I always I always prefer to stack for people too. Sometimes it shoots you in the foot because it's, yeah, my wood piles through the fence, way into the backyard, and you can only take a wheelbarrow at a time. But I just, as a customer service oriented person, like I don't like just dump the wood in the driveway and then it's like, here you go, there's your mess to clean up. You know, I prefer to just stack it neat and I don't know, something kind of, artsy about like a cool looking stack of firewood too. What's your favorite kind of wood to cut? Ooh, cut, I would say ash for sure. Burn, I would, my perfect fire probably has three species in it. Oak for a long burn and a lot of heat. Ash for a nice, bright, vibrant flame and cherry for the fragrance. I'm, I'm kind of fancy with my burn stuff. I like a I like a blend. Do you have customers that like heat their homes with wood and they buy like large supplies from you? We have a few. What I found on folks that are heating with wood is that they they really try to barter and knock you down on your price. I'm happy to to sell to them. It's great because it's high volume, but uh, they typically are looking for you know, a cheaper price. Like the, the wood we split, I call it bundle grade. So if you look at these pieces, they're pretty small. More uh, set up or, or kind of more engineered for somebody, just a casual fire on Thanksgiving with, with friends over. I don't need the heat, but I have a few. I do have a few. I've got, I've got sort of the, the hybrid person who's like, I've got a gas furnace in my house, but I like to burn wood all winter. So yeah, I've got a gal I just brought a couple face cords to who's who heats like 80% of her house with wood, but she also appreciates like clean stuff that's smaller. It's, you know, some of these chunks, a piece of oak that's that big is pretty heavy. You know, it's 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 hard to lug around. A lot of fire uh, fireplaces or, or wood stoves are smaller. So that piece doesn't even fit in there. Do you think the size of like the stand here makes a difference in what people see when they drive by or say you had it even bigger, you think it would be more attractive or you think it doesn't make a difference in your sales? I think this size was sort of a in between of bigger is better in the sense of if somebody comes, like I've had people that come and they, they wipe this whole thing out and then I don't know right away. So, you know, it could be empty for the next person trying to get some wood out of it. I think kind of it's, it's big enough and tall enough that, you know, that road there's a bunch of subdivisions down that way so when they come up and you you come to that stop sign it's kind of on display you know going this way up and down celine Milan road it's you don't see it as much but i think it's enough to for someone to see it especially coming to the stop sign there i don't know i, I think if i did it again i would do pretty much the same size i like I like that I can just, it's not so heavy because it's all tube steel. So it's its pretty its pretty beefy, but I can, with two guys, I can shimmy this onto my trailer. And if I had another location, I could move it. So that's sort of appealing to, I wanted it to be accessible from both sides. So I want people to be safe. 
they pull in, they're behind it, and they can load from the back and not have to come here because like we're kind of on a hilltop, it's hard to see out. So I want people to be able to, to pull straight out instead of having to back out into something busy. And then earlier you said something about the honor system. So are you guys like taking cash? Where where does the payment? Yeah, so this is purely just a, a cash box with a lock here, you know, welded on that we check periodically and, and it's been it's been perfect. It's been great. And you only take cash, like there's no Venmo or anything like that? There isn't at the moment. I've I've got a Venmo account that I could, uh, you know, another kind of future state was a, a little laminated sheet here with a little bit of our story and some Venmo info. But cash is kind of nice because if I'm buying wood or I'm paying for repairs and stuff, I got a lot of folks that prefer cash too, so it's nice to have a little bit. Girls like, girls like taking the lock off and seeing how much cash is in the box. They don't really like the concept of money when it's just a Venmo transaction, like it doesn't do anything for a little young mind, you know, but like you open it up and you see $100 in bills, it's like, whoa. Do you have three tips of advice for any other entrepreneurs out there? So entrepreneurs in general, you know, find something that you don't mind really putting a lot of time and effort into. You gotta love the core of the business first and I think I think following that allows you to be successful in it. So I, I love being outside. I love running a saw. I love the smell of, you know, freshly cut oak and cherry firewood. So to me, it's just, it's more peaceful time than, than anything. I guess a second tip would be invest in quality equipment, quality tools. You know, if I have a chainsaw that breaks or a splitter that breaks it, and I have two hours to work on a given day, that kind of, you know, a big hold on what I wanted to get done that day so so buying a for example i've got a, a dump trailer that's galvanized instead of painted it's a lot more expensive but that finish should never rust over time or take a lot longer buying quality chainsaws you know your critical components of your business you know i kind of have this buy once cry once philosophy like spend the money buy it one time buy the best stuff you can and and you'll always be happy you did